Thank you. So last week, as you know, um, we held the 17th Annual American Indian Disability Summit, and we had quite a few, um, well, no, we had, a, every presentation was great throughout the day. And some of the carryover messages from the Disability Summit you'll hear today from our presenters, Dr. Jared Joseph and um, Mr. Jim Warren. Our resiliency is really um, gonna keep us together and keep us focused as we manage through COVID times. So with the summit being postponed last year, we had created a different agenda, focusing on workforce development, employment, um, housing, just a lot of different um, topics surrounded around the social determinants of health. But we had to change and adjust and adjust our schedules. So this year's summit, we're focusing on resiliency. And through our speakers, you're gonna hear what resiliency means to us as American Indians and folks living on or near troubled community lands. Um, Jeff, did you wanna post the uh, agenda? Yes. So today, this morning, prior to our keynote, Dr. Gerald speaking, Dr. Gerald Joseph speaking, um, we were going to present our first Tribal Youth Leadership Award, the Jim E. Warren Tribal Youth Leadership Award. And back in 2019, we had identified a young youth that lives out on the Gila River Indian Reservation. And he's a, he was a young child, six years old. He should be about eight now because he's half the year. So, and he was selected as a Tribal Youth Leadership Award because a lot of the attributes that we have for this leadership award, Jim is gonna share with us um, this young gentleman um, shared. He is an elementary student and had not been in school. So he had um, faced some challenges and some barriers. And when he first was able to get to school, um, his mother was very concerned that he would have issues or challenges. Um, he's a wheelchair user, had not been out into um, schools at all. So when he did get to school, I was really grateful to hear that the other young children out in the playground, out in the school system, out in the school um, school classes, uh, she was worried that he wouldn't be received or accepted. And um, after a week, after a month or two, spoke with the mom and he had transitioned very well into the school system with the help of supports that are out there. And he actually could not have done that with the support. So everyone that's on the um, summit today, the, today's webinar, really appreciate you stepping up, taking the time to learn more about how our youth have needs, our youth with special needs um, need to have those resources that may not be on the local reservation or the community, but we may have to reach out to other organizations such as state state programs as well as federal programs for that support. So I did share this with Jim that um, because of COVID, lost communications with the mom, um, I've been calling her and I'm thinking that perhaps, you know, with all the robo calls going on out there, um, she may not be taking my calls. So next year, you know, we'd like to make a, have a physical presence next year. We're, we're looking forward to that. And next year we'll um, share this award with our young person um, in person at the next board, while also awarding the second annual Jim Warren Tribal Youth Leadership Award. So Jim, um, leaving this time up to you to share more about the Youth Leadership Award. Washte uh, Palamia, Kimberly, I appreciate that introduction. And uh, uh, all of our hopes and uh, prayers and good thoughts are with the family of the uh, our first uh, person to get the appropriately named Jim Warren Youth Leadership Award because I'm Jim Jr. And my dad, Jim Sr. is the reason why I work in disability. So my dad, Jim Sr., I see this award being named for him because it was his strength and resiliency with multiple sclerosis. Uh, in high school, he was, he contracted, when I was in high school, living in Tempe, Arizona, going to Tempe High School, my dad uh, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And back in those days, they were still having trouble diagnosing that disease. So my dad was going through a lot of complications and we as a family had to come together and not only uh, support him, but do whatever we could to 
uh, make sure that he had access and uh, was included in society. Uh, it's appropriate I'm here in Tempe in my parents' house because this house we made to be accessible for wheelchairs, for disability issues, for big and tall people. I'm a big person and my dad was a big man too. So I I'm, want to make sure that uh, this award is a great honor for me, but I'm, uh, I see it as honoring my father, uh, the generation before me that showed me what true strength was when he would take a, at least an hour to get from his bed to the bathroom to get ready to go to work. And he could barely move just inch by inch when he was losing his ability to walk. And then eventually he started using a wheelchair and still did that routine every day to go to work. So that's why I love vocational rehabilitation and empowerment programs and uh, disability programs that allow our people to show their true strength. For our tribal members, remember, we don't have a term for disability in any of our languages. We just have circumstances. We are all related as two-legged as human beings, but we also have our unique circumstances, which could be labeled disability, but always think of your strengths and abilities because everybody has abilities, no matter what your disability is. So that's what I want you to really think about is don't see your disability, see your true self, see the strength within your heart and what the ancestors represented. And uh, again, this is honoring my father, uh, Jim Sr. He is a wonderful example for a young man to grow up with as a dad. Although everyone saw him as, uh, you know, oh, poor man, he has to use a wheelchair. I saw him as the strongest man I ever met. So again, concentrate on those positives, concentrate on your abilities and always move forward making good footprints or wheel prints or prosthetic prints, whatever prints that you happen to make, make prints that make a difference for future generations. So in honor of my father, uh, I'm so honored to have this uh, named the leadership award named and my father's Jim Senior's name. So, and I'll represent as best I can for this generation. So Palami Awashte, thank you so much for this great honor. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, Jim Warren is actually the grandfather of all of this event today, Youth Summit, the summit that happened last week. Um, Jim came down to Phoenix and held the disability, American Indian Disability Talking Circle and my, I myself have worked in the field of disabilities for about 32 years and had um, really enjoyed the concepts that were presented at that summit, at, at the talking circle. And it was um, very inviting to know that there are others out there that have the advocacy skills that want to build up on them through collaborations, community collaborations. And, the um, talking circle that Jim held was a springboard to make all of this happen. So we have the disability, some, a disability talking circle first. We spoke about different um, situations, as Jim mentioned, that we find ourselves in, um, and especially focused on American Indians with disabilities, some of the challenges that are out there that others might not see. So coming together, you know, Jim helped create the strength in numbers. And today for this summit, we have close to 200 people registered. Um, on the on, at 16th annual summit, we held, um, we had four tribal youth that attended the summit. And there was close to 100 or so participants with four tribal youth. And they were uh, from the local Arizona tribal community. And they were waiting in the halls and there wasn't any youth sessions or youth targeted sessions out there for them. So I sat with them and chatted with them and they all have really, really great stories to share. You know, they were there as children of, you know, that had parents with disabilities, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunties, and they had came there to get resources. And for youth, it's a little bit different as you know, working with, with youth, tribal youth in particular. So I asked the um, planning committee if I could coordinate this youth summit. And today we, we started off with four, and now today we have close to 200 folks registered for this event. So 
Wobila, Colombia, Wilayan Pituki Marche. Today is a good day. Thank you, everybody. With that being said, I want to move forward and in, introduce our morning keynote speaker. Um, okay, so just experiencing a little technical difficulties. So uh, I'm going to take this moment to just um, thank the planning group for putting on the general summit last Friday and helping put on uh, today's summit today. And that goes to, we, thanks to Ability360 Auction um, Indian Community, Arizona, Rehabilitation Services Administration, uh, the University of Arizona, Sonoran Center for Excellence in Disabilities, the ARC of Arizona, United Healthcare Community Plan, and Banner University Family Care. Um, again, thanks to our planning committee um, and their respective organizations. I'm going to check and see if Kimberly is still here. Doesn't look like it. So, um, Dr. Daryl Joseph, uh, would you mind um, <laughs> beginning your keynote um, for our session, our summit today? Okay, great. Uh, so, I, I just want to be sure that uh, we look out for Kim. Um, she had the script for the introduction, but let me uh, tell you a little bit about myself um, as part of the keynote presentation. If um, you know, I may, uh, I'm, I'm not here by myself. I actually have a team of people um, who are with me. Um, I have uh, my beautiful wife, Dr. Elise Eli Joseph, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Applied Indigenous Studies Department here at NAU. Um, I also have uh, my clan sister, Teresa Martza, who um, is a, a master's student in uh, mental health counseling here at Northern Arizona University. Uh, and then I have another sister, um, Hannah Hanani, who is the program manager for the Hopi Opportunity Youth Initiative Project located on the Hopi Reservation. Uh, and then um, our beautiful Miss uh, Indian USA, uh, Lexi James, who gave our um, prayer. Thank you, Lexi, for doing that. Um, and she is also our youth liaison for the Hopi Opportunity Youth Initiative Project. And then finally, we have Eugene Cody, who is the data manager for the um, Hoi Project. Um, so when you hear Hoi today, that's who we're referring to as a project located on, on the Hopi Reservation. Um, so I come from you, come to you from, uh, currently I'm sitting in Flagstaff, Arizona, but uh, I am sitting here in front of a beautiful backdrop behind me is a picture of uh, a beautiful red valley um, leading into the village of Munkapi, uh, which means place where the water flows. Um, and this is my home community of Hopi. Um, and so um, I also sit at the base of the San Francisco peaks. And so I want to take this time to um, start us off with, you know, doing a land acknowledgement um, and thinking about our beautiful Navatika OV here, which is the San Francisco Peaks. It's on the homeland sacred to our Hopi people um, and other Native American tribes throughout our region. Um, and in doing so, we honor also the past, the present and future generations who have lived here for millennia and who will forever call this place home. Um, so with that said, I'm just going to take a, a moment to give you a brief history um, of my, my experience working in, in the disability field. And let me do this while I pull up this form. Um, so I am a son, brother, husband, father, and grandfather. Uh, my matrilineal family are from the Coyote clan or Iswangwa. Um, and my patrilineal family is from Nuwawungwa, or Snow Clan, from the village of Sungopavi. Um, I was born and raised on Hopi. I graduated from Tuba City High School. Um, I attended Northern Arizona University to complete my undergraduate and graduate degrees um, in education. After I completed, I returned home to serve as a teacher and administrator for special ed in K-12 settings. 
It was during this time that I learned about the need to increase the advocacy and representation of and for indigenous communities and youth related to special education, uh, the concept of disability and culture. So to address this, I uh, decided to return back to school. Um, I attended the University of Arizona to complete my uh, PhD in special education. Um, I am now an assistant professor uh, preparing pre-service educators in the professions of special education and elementary ed in the Department of Educational Specialties and Teaching and Learning in the College of Education at NAU. Um, I'm also um, come to you with experience teaching in the Applied Indigenous Studies program at NAU. Um, and then also have held a position of the Vocational Rehabilitation Specialist uh, for the American Indian Vocational Rehabilitation Training and Technical Assistance Center based out of Northern Arizona University. Um, and I can see that we have some of our um, community members from AverTech um, and Avers programs here. So welcome to all of you that are out there. Um, and that center, we uh, really provided technical assistance to, at that time, it was 88 American Indian Vocational Rehabilitation Service Programs um, in the area of policy development, service delivery, and reporting uh, to really, um, with the notion of enhancing workforce development um, to serve community members in tribal communities uh, for those who have disabilities. Um, so with that said, you know, currently, um, you know, I, my research uh, through NAU has really been informed by my own experience. Um, and as, as I focus on the intersections of disability with social cultural differences that inform educational inequities for American Indian and Alaska Native youth. Through an indigenous lens of resilience, uh, I aim to advance opportunities for individuals experiencing disability to persist in education, health and wellness, and cultural well being, uh, contributing to the current partnership that we have with the Hopi Tribes Hopi Opportunity Youth Initiative Project titled We Are Resilient focused on identifying factors contributing to resilience of Native American youth in the Hopi Tewa community. Um, as I mentioned before, my project team is here with me. Um, for the sake of time, I had asked each of them if you would now, um, project team, to, to post your uh, brief introductions in the chat box. Um, and if you have the option to, it'd be great to see your faces at the current time. They will be jumping in right now to uh, a little later on during the presentation to, there they are, um, to share a few words about our partnership. So we have Lexi, um, Hannah, Teresa, um, Eugene. Eugene is a little shy sometimes, so he doesn't put on his camera, but he's out there. I know you are, Eugene. Um, and then my wife is actually in another uh, meeting right now, so she's not able to attend. But I do want to welcome our team um, to this presentation as well um, today. So at the current time, what I'm going to do is go ahead and share the PowerPoint on the screen. I believe I have access or privileges to do that. You do. So, OK, so let me let me pull that up now. Uh, OK, can you? Can you confirm if you can see the full PowerPoint presentation? We see it. Okay, perfect. All right. Uh, and you, you don't see the chat box and pictures, do you? Nope. Okay, perfect. Okay, so our, our theme for today is really indigenous resilience um, and looking at youth well being. Um, as we talk about this, uh, it really speaks to the notion of thinking about, you know, uh, what uh, Mr. Warren had expressed in terms of our generations, um, both the, the past pre or all the past, present and future generations. Um, and so as we move forward, I, I do want to think about how we encompass this by utilizing a story as you know, stories are so important um, in our communities. And, and this one is Artiwati Ivava Ankh, you know, it's from my brother. Um, and on the slide, um, what you see are five different pictures. In the very middle is my brother when 
Um, I would say, I, sh I should have asked him, he's probably about eight, nine years old there um, in, a, in that 70s, 80s style long sleeve turtleneck shirt. Um, to the right of that picture, there is a, up in the upper right hand corner, he's there with um, his ceremonial dress on. Um, this is during a butterfly dance next to his partner who he danced with. Um, who has a beautiful headdress on. Um, and then just below that picture, um, my brother Garrett is sitting on a lazy boy recliner with um, our dog Star sitting on his lap and he's there with a big smile um, on his face. And then to the left of the screen is, um, to the top left corner um, is a picture that we took a couple of weekends ago, um, both him and I had went to our cornfields to prepare it for, um, you know, the planting season. And this is, you know, just after we had been done completing some of our work there. Uh, and to the bottom left, uh, you see a picture of him in a football uniform. Um, you know, the traditional kneel down on your knees, um, have your helmet in front of you, um, and with his hands on his hip with the number 77 on his white jersey. Um, and so, you know, I, I start this story of my, my brother Vava, his name is Garrett Joseph. Um, Vava is a term used for older brother in Hopi. Um, in my family, I also have a younger sister um, and we are each seven years apart. Each of us were born back home on Hopi, but our stories differed with how we experienced growing up. My brother being the firstborn began his journey with my parents, farming, ranching, going from village to village for ceremony and experienced great things in his early childhood. Seven years into his life, I was born. So a surprise, I was his younger brother, he was my older brother. Um, and I had, you know, I had a brother, I had a Vava. And from what I can recall, looking at pictures of our childhood, we got along for most of the time, <laughs> jokingly said. But at age four, um, when, when I was age four, my brother was no longer in our household on a daily basis. You see, I didn't realize um, what was happening at that time, um, but my brother experienced multiple disabilities including being hearing impaired and having speech impairments. So from what our mother shared, because we lived on the reservation and my brother didn't have the access to resources and services, um, including having an ASL interpreter, which we are so fortunate to have today. So thank you very much for your services. Um, he didn't have access to regular speech services and other services he needed to um, perform at his ability within the school setting. Um, a, diff a difficult decision was made uh, for him to attend the Arizona State School for the Deaf and Blind located in Tucson, Arizona. So at age 11, my brother began his journey moving to Tucson, Arizona until he graduated from ASDB. See, I tell you this story because Sorry, it's the first time I'm telling this story. Because it's his story of resilience during his journey of life. There are so many experiences he has had that have been challenging. And in the face of it all, he has overcome. Recently, my bro and I had a conversation about how I remembered this, this shiny, fancy charter bus with the letters ASDB on the side of the charter bus coming to the reservation. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Tuba City, it was the old Tuba City truck stop, a famous place actually. Um, and now how I remember him climbing on and off that bus at the beginning and end of each school year. 
Um, and so during our recent time together, um, a few weeks ago, I had asked him, you know, about this time that if he recalls um, some of his experiences um, and how he felt, you know, when he had to leave home. And he talked about how sad it was to leave um, his home community and how he would remember other kids from the reservation who would cry because they wanted to go home. Um, and how he would just cover his ears. And I proceeded to ask him, did you also cry? Um, and he said he didn't, he didn't want to cry. Um, and he handled this by covering his ears and trying not to hear the voices of others express their sadness about having to leave home. Today, as you can see there, he, he looks younger than he actually is. He's 50 years old. I'm in my 40s. Uh, my sister is hitting her 40s. Um, he has his own apartment in Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, he returns home um, to mom and dad to help. He tends to the cornfields. He is self, he's a self-employed jewelry maker and baker. He carries out cultural and ceremonial responsibilities, and he has a network of friends you would not believe. And I'm sure some of you who are on with us right now know who Garrett is. Um, because he is a baker, he makes some delicious Hopi cookies and is known as the cookie monster uh, for those of us who know who are from the community. Um, everywhere we go, someone knows Garrett. So we are going to come back to my brother's story as we move through this. But one of the things that I have learned as, um, you know, relation to my brother's story is, you know, my brother's indigenous ways of knowing has always contributed to his resilience during, his diff during the times of struggle exemplified by having to start essentially boarding school at a very young age, being disconnected from family and community. To this day, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Hopi um, ceremonies, uh, we go into our ceremonial trade chambers called the Kiva. Um, to this day, he leads me into our ceremonial chambers. Um, when he's with me, I ask him to lead and, he, and I follow. He teaches me with ceremonial obligations and these are the things that have remained true for him um, up into this day. So with that said, I'm gonna move us forward uh, to uh, the next slide to present to you the concept of indigenous resilience. So as you see on um, what we speak about is this notion that indigenous resilience is, oh, let me see, um, you know, the inclusion of indigenous knowledge and experiences to overcome difficult and ongoing challenges. Uh, exemplified through my brother's story of recalling um, and participating in activities um, even when he was away from home um, and, and holding those at the core of his experiences. And so I'd like to present a few concepts um, to you as a, especially to the youth who are attending today, uh, uh, you know, and thinking about youth well-being. Um, to essentialize who we are as Indigenous people. For Indigenous people, there are four essential concepts that we hold true um, that are related to sacred history, uh, meaning that, you know, these are histories told from our mother tongues to identify where we come from. Um, it creates relationships and connections to things like our ceremonies, it provides an explanation of our distinct cultures, customs, and even our political economy in a cultural context. Next, we have language. Um, again, another distinction of our people that allows us to communicate and tell our oral histories. Language creates the context within our cultural environment. It gives history and meaning of its own particularly of origin, creation, and migration. Next, we have um, oral, let's see, we have, uh, where am I, ceremony. And ceremony is 
basically our group's way of life, inseparably linked to language, sacred history, and a particular environment. It informs our worldview. And lastly, land, our territory, our place. It's our living relationship to where we come from. Every human group has some type of relationship, organic in nature, living relationship, relationship in which humans consider it a part of heritage. It's our homelands. Um, so an expression of that is the, the backdrop that I have, which is my village of Munkapi. Um, and so in thinking about these, uh, when we think about the term disability, there is a lot to explore um, as uh, Mr. Warren had expressed the idea that many indigenous communities, we don't have a term for disability. Rather, we use these concepts to integrate and find role and roles and a place of belonging to create sense of belonging for all people that are part of our community because we share these concepts. And so with that said, when we think about things like um, recognizing ourselves as the states that we come from, I'm an Arizonan, I'm an Oklahoman, um, thinking about nationalism, I am a United States citizen, I'm a Mexican citizen, um, you know, thinking about gender identification, um, ethnicity or disability. When we think about the concepts presented here, these concepts actually help us transcend those components of identity and relate to one another as human beings. Um, and make connections to the places that we come from. So as we think about moving forward and thinking about where we come from and identifying purpose, um, I encourage all of our youth um, to, to have a sense of understanding about what each of these concepts may mean for them. What are our sacred histories? What is the languages that we now speak and did speak in our past and want to continue speaking? What are our ceremonial ways of life and how can we participate that even if we are not specifically in the physical location of our home communities? Um, and what is the connection that we have to land and how do we recognize that on a daily basis? Moving forward, um, you know, I, I bring to us the idea that we have cultural values uh, from an indigenous lens. And I present to you uh, what we have, um, you know, that the Americans for Indian Opportunity, who was led and founded by um, LaDonna Harris, who is uh, a Native American rights activist. Um, we know her as Mama LaDonna. Um, and she, she um, leads young youth um, professionals into leadership positions, um, kind of identifying the four R's that are related to relationships, uh, responsibility, reciprocity, and redistribution. And I, and I use those concepts here to express the idea that um, when we talk about re relationships, we're talking about this in the most profound sense um, that we are all related. Humans are related to both each other and to all things. In our sense of responsibility, we have community. We have a duty to care for our relatives. Every human being is accountable for the well being of their kin. The, um, and so we move on to reciprocity. Our relationships and our responsibilities shape our roles in life and are recipro reciprocal as the nature of the universe. And so we know this in many of our indigenous knowledge systems that reciprocity is so important that makes us value the idea that we are interconnected beings. Um, it's an articulation and understanding that all things are connected, all things are cyclical um, and fundamental to how we develop our worldview within our universe. So it causes, the, it causes us to um, really strive for this idea of balance. 
redistribution um, is our reciprocal relationships um, and responsibilities that guide us to share our resources and help us to maintain balance. The collective and communal traditions of our ancestors, ancestors teach us that, we, that wealth must be shared for the greater good of the whole. In contemporary society, that includes the sharing of information, knowledge, and resources. And so lastly, I add on to that this, the, the, the value of respect and being respectful. Um, being mindful of honoring our ways of being and knowledge systems to engage the four, our, four R's. So the four R's plus one here that, I, that I've presented was the in, intention and notion that when we speak about youth, um, particularly as it relates to their place of belonging, their sense of belonging, their relationship to community, um, that we think about it in terms of our value systems. Every indigenous community, um, past, present, and future, maintains some aspect of these values within our communities. Um, if I were to turn to the audience right now and ask you, what are, what are the terms that you use in your community? What are the traditional terms that you use to exemplify relationship? to exemplify responsibility, reciprocity, redistribution, respectfulness, um, you all would be well able to tell me um, from your lens what this means for your community. And I would even challenge you to use the chat box, use our technology uh, to do that now and enter. Um, what, what is this for your community? Um, how do you interpret this? How does your community express this? Um, and for the youth, how do you interpret it and, and work with these concepts as you move forward into your um, daily experiences and, and life ways of being? So with that said, I, I wanna move, move to our next slide um, and talk some about the notion of um, social inequalities. Uh, so, First of all, let, let me let me define uh, social inequalities, and it's really the, you know the idea that we there are inequalities that systemically exist that impede um, opportunities for um, communities to express to to be in a place of inclusion um, in all aspects of society. So if we think about buildings, you know, if we're individuals experiencing physical disabilities and are in a wheelchair, um, having a, a building that's not wheelchair accessible is a social inequality. If we have had someone like my brother who it had to move away from home uh, because there were no resources in the local community on the reservation, that is a social inequality. So as youth, when we think about our social dynamics, there are intersections of identity that exist around these notions of ability. I, I, I am confident to say that many of us in our community, when we talk about ability, we can obviously make some relationships to the term disability. Right? So when we talk about communities of normalness, um, we think about what fits within that norm um, and how does that create the difference of and notion of otherness right? and the, the, the ability to fit in that. We also talk about culture. In indigenous communities, our cultures are very unique that we have our own language systems, our own connections to land, as I mentioned earlier, this notion of peoplehood um, that make us unique, um, that are very different from Western constructs, constructs and ways of thinking, very different world ways of thinking and presenting this idea of worldview. Um, we have very strong, especially in our present day, examples of inequalities across the, the line of race. We think about, you know, indigenous or Native American people, American Indian people, 
um, African Americans, Hispanics, whites, um, we can pull up a number of social inequalities across, across race lines. Class, socioeconomic status, um, you know, the, the constructs and the inequalities presented when, when we may be coming from a background that's not economically advantaged. Um, gender, um, we know there are many inequalities when we speak about gender and how we identify um, with gender. Sexuality, the same. Ethnicity, the same. So as we examine and think about how we experience social inequalities, um, we also want to understand that there are multiple ways. It's not just one, especially for our people and our youth who experience living with a disability, that this intersectionality occurs. Um, and thus, the importance of why we have to address what these social inequalities are. So I'd like to take a moment right now um, to turn to the audience. Um, I see that we have about 107 people um, joining us today. And so um, I'd like to ask each of you to turn to your chat box um, as, as um, you're able to um, and list some of the social inequalities or barriers um, that individuals with this slash mark ability may experience at the intersections. So as we, as we identified some of these social inequalities, what are those barriers that are experienced? Um, and please put in your own personal um, experiences as well. It'd be great to see what you have come up with. Um, and so when we think about those barriers, what are the solutions that you propose to address the inequalities and barriers you identified? So what are the barriers experienced and what are the solutions you propose? So I'm gonna give you a minute um, as we do this, as I take a drink of my coffee. Do I have a member of our Hawaii team who would like to start reading off some of the comments? We have barriers, accessibility and distance, having to travel to receive services, solutions, include state and federal outreach to better serve the underserved area, uh, cognitive problems when having trouble with reading fluency. We also have another comment, society's perspective on disability and how we can change those perspectives. Access to health care is a barrier, access to services, building accessibility, and also culturally relevant mental health incorporate traditional Western teaching. These are all great responses. LGBTQ plus pride events not being accessible, as well as being very white centered and being very centered on substance abuse. Basing school funding property funding on property. Oh, I'm skipping on sorry. On property taxes, it should be distributed fairly so all students have opportunities. And access to ceremony, lodges, circles, sacred sites. Follow me on for that. Specialized services for multiple diagnosis. People problems. Oops, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. People problems, whether or not to feel maybe pitied. I think that, um, having a voice or even knowing that they can say what they need. Not knowing what services may be available because they're not even offered if you don't have money. Lack of inclusion and voice in K through 12 curriculum and school climate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Those are all so important issues. Um, and so as you can see, um, 
as we think about these intersections, um, we're, we're talking about the impact for our youth communities. I think as, as we move forward and really assess the climate we all exist and coexist in, um, especially with the current, um, the current pandemic and the atrocities um, it has, and the ways that has impacted our native communities. You know, we have elders, we have youth, we have our parents, uncles, aunties um, who have um, succumbed to the pandemic. And I just got a call this morning that a, good, a cousin of mine had also just, um, you know, left us due to having COVID. And so as, as we think about these things, uh, there are structural inequalities that require us to go back to the concepts we just presented around um, ability around, oh, here we go, the, the four R's, um, actually not the four R's, but sacred history, language, ceremony, land, and what this means in a contemporary setting. We come from a place of an existence as being indigenous people that are that we have sacred history. But as we are moving through time, we're developing new contemporary contexts as how we relate to these concepts. And so what does that mean for us? What does that mean for our youth? Um, what are the new experiences that were not here 50, 100, 200 years ago that our youth were dealing with then? And so as we move forward, I present to you the idea of, of Nohongta, to be empowered. Um, Nohongvita is, in our Hopi language, uh, uh, the term for encouraging people to be strong, to be empowered. I always imagine in our communities of Hopi, we have races every year um, that people race from the bottom of a mesa, um, starting off on flat ground and then encroaching on very soft sand and then a steep climb up a mesa top. And all the while there's community members consisting of elders, uncles, aunts, children, screaming from the top of their lungs off the mesa top to the runners, Nohongvita, 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 way, be strong, be strong, be strong. And you can imagine as runners that their physical strength, their mental strength, their emotional strength is being tested, right? To, her, to the point that they're questioning, should I stop running? But the response is, no, I don't, because they hear these voices of encouragement coming. And so this is where Nahongvi, the, the conceptual model, comes into place. The idea that there's a level of being empowered that comes from self with a relationship to the community. Um, in this diagram, there's a pie chart with four pieces of the pie um, in the four directions. Um, in the top um, direction facing north uh, is the pie labeled community, um, responsibility to youth future generations, um, moving in a clockwise movement. There is the next piece of the pie, which is labeled home um, with parentheses around I mean, uh, quotations around the H, little H home, um, titled environment, introducing secondary cultural resources, moving in a clockwise to the south. There is the pie titled political, economic, traditional, contemporary, um, signifying history, uh, and then rotating uh, more to uh, in a clockwise to the uh, nine o'clock hour is the pie titled environment providing primary cultural resources. Um, and the title for that is, is capital H home. So we use this term to introduce this idea that um, if you take my brother's experience, for example, he was brought up in the capital H home, the primary, the environment providing cultural, primary cultural resources, the environment that informed his worldview, the environment that gave him the language, the history and the knowledge to sustain himself in other environments. And in this case, going into ASDB, which was the lowercase h home. In moving to those 
communities, there's a significant component and responsibility of the community. And when I say community, I, I mean both the capital H and the lowercase h home community uh, in the respect that in aspects that our youth are leaving or engaging and, and learning and navigating spaces that introduce new ways of thinking, we have a responsibility to engage our youth in having an understanding about themselves and who they are. Um, preparing them to be well in their journey and the steps they take into their future. In the same respect that we talk about the receiving institution, in this case for my brother, it was ASDB. They have a responsibility to receive the individual in the way that is culturally responsive and supportive of the well-being of the individual. And we can apply this to many different settings. Most of you, a lot of you talked about, um, you know, the social inequalities experienced around, um, you know, schooling um, and, and what that means for our youth. Most of, some of you talked about accessibility, um, these physical spaces. Um, we have a responsibility to, to support our youth through this transition and navigate, help them navigate um, as they're moving between these spaces. But to do that, we also have to have some context and knowledge of his history, um, both political, economic, traditional, and contemporary. And I say that because it's our history, both our sacred history related to our indigenous experiences, um, the reasons as to why we practice ceremony, um, even the harsh realities of the historical trauma experienced with assimilation um, forced boarding school experiences, and then into more of a contemporary context, um, the challenges we're experiencing with these social inequalities um, within our tribal communities, but also now that we're, our demographics are changing as indigenous communities are now moving into urban locations. We have demographics that require us to adapt and change how we think about empowering our youth to be in the home vita. Um, and so as we move forward and think about this, this concept, I'm going to jump forward again um, and ask, you know, the follow up question, what solutions do you propose to address these social inequalities? And I see that some of you have already listed um, some Marie Strahan, you indicated broad brand band everywhere real mentoring and follow along mentoring for our youth, creating independent living services in every native community and making sure that self advocacy is part of our service systems. Uh, Roy uh, indicates that the Arizona Center for African American Resources believes that the intersectionality between indigenous peoples and emancipated slaves has many commonalities. I would like to have more conversations with like thinking persons about our findings. So Roy's exemplifying communication, right? Learning from one another. Um, Marie is talking about, you know, the realities that were exposed with broadband using technology. Um, I can uh, provide a couple of other activities, you know, in our work with um, Dr. Lee Geshyama at the Avertac Center. Um, you know, they we have we have laws um, that ha had really generated from the civil rights movement, um, where there is the Vocational, Rehabil Vocational Rehabilitation Act that um, provided opportunities for employment, which is why we have the AVERS programs um, to help individuals in tribal communities who have disabilities pursue employment as a way to balance um, access and equality to employment opportunities. Um, we know that social inequalities for education, you know, in 1975, we have um, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act was adopted, uh, federal legislation was adopted, um, but prior to 1975, our, our community members with disabilities, unless you were economically advantaged, um, were either, you, individuals were either kept home or sent to institutions. Um, in the 70s. So we've come 
a long way, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, so Winona Reed, hey, Winona, you're here, um, says she bought a pair of earrings from your brother 12 years ago. I can't believe it. <laughs> I'm wearing them today. Great. See, I told you everyone knows Garrett. Um, Winona Blackfeather says networking opportunities like this event so we can share and learn what services may be available. Dr. Geshama says tribal elders with a traditional knowledge and wisdom revitalize the practice of oral teaching to youth and young adults. Very important, um, Lee, you know, that we respect, again, the term respect um, and acknowledge the history, you know, and the knowledge that our, our elders hold very important you know when we think about what is the place in a western construct that elder indigenous knowledge from elders is held at a high value we don't see that very often um, so there's a lot of work to be engaged in around this concept of how do we address these social inequalities um, so with that said you know i, I expressed in in my introduction that um, when i was back home working on the reservation, uh, serving as a teacher and administrator in special education, I realized uh, that there wasn't much literature and much being written about, um, about how to do my job better um, who I, and how I could learn to do, be more culturally responsive um, and realized that I needed to create agency and voice uh, and, and, and place myself in a place of empowerment um, to make a change. And so with that message, I encourage all of our youth um, to think about that, you know, about the challenges and barriers that you're observing, experiencing, and think about how can we implement agency and our voice in making a change. Last week uh, during the youth summit or the um, disability summit, my wife shared two pictures. One is of the black and white um, on the screen that you see here of our um, elders, our Hopi elders who were removed from the um, Hopi, um, Hopi lands for refusing to adopt um, indigenous ways of, I mean, it, refusing to adopt Western constructs of education and farming. And so they were imprisoned in the 1800s. Um, for for resisting. That's agency and voice. They were doing this for the people. And then, you, and so from that message, we hear from that timeline, we hear this story that in terms of resistance, there was a message that many of us here in our tribal communities, and it's, you know, meaning that go get your education and help your people, return and advocate for your people. And that was to, those were, I think, messages to think about how we can use these Western constructs of tools for empowerment, tools to protect our people. Um, there are many stories about having our people sign treaties without really understanding what they meant. And as a result, we gave up a lot of land. So as we think about that, what are we doing to learn from the constructs of Western culture to then adapt it, modify it so that we're protecting our people? Um, and then also last week, my wife presented to you, um, you know, the story of um, Mr. Noah Hotchkiss. Um, and he presented this message, you know, uh, that, you know, with experiencing disability, being in a wheelchair from because of an accident, um, that he said, you know, I'm not seeing barriers I can't get over anymore, but I'm seeing barriers I can overcome. Now I'm always up for challenges. So these two examples from history, you know, our sacred history um, and our current history, we're seeing these voices of agency emerge. And as individuals with who experience disability, um, there are many more stories that are out there. Thinking about that, um, I, I want to go to the next slide, which is practicing the four R's plus one. So I want to move into some of our current work that we're doing with the Hoi 
um, community. And one of the things that was very important to us as a way to have agency and voice from my position of being in a university and creating community was bringing together NAU, which is the lowercase h home, and then the capital H home, which is Hopi, to leverage our relationships to address community concerns. Carrying responsibility to care for youth in the community. Accounting for and acknowledging the role of reciprocal relationships to serve one another. Uh, and engaging responsibility to redistribute our resources to address community concern and maintain that balance we're striving for. Uh, and being respectful and accountable to our ways of being. So at times when things don't work um, from an NAU perspective, relying on that indigenous knowledge perspective and asking what is the best way to move forward? Who do we involve? Who do we invite to our conversations? Um, all on behalf of looking at the well-being of our youth in the Hopi community. So at this time, I, I do want to invite um, Hannah Hanani, the program manager for the Hopi Opportunity Youth Initiative Project. Hannah, are you there? I can't see video, so I'm not sure if you're there. She has her camera on. Okay. Um, oh, she, I think she's on mute. Okay, she's on mute. Okay, so Hannah, I'm going to turn it over to you to um, introduce um, yourselves and um, take it away from here. Oh, I think she's working on her sound system. So, um, so before we get into that, I, I guess what I would like to express to you is that um, many of our Native communities and the reason for our project was to address some of the recent concerns. You know, with technology, we're learning that, um, you know, the pandemic has put our youth in places where they're home, um, separating them from their um, friendships, um, engaging in social spaces um, that really support social well-being. Um, and, you know, learning from them what their voices tell us about how we can support them better to, to support their mental health and well-being. Um, so, Hannah, are you available? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, good morning, everybody. It's still morning time. I was already going to say afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be amongst all of you and doing the um, important work that we're all doing. And I am grateful to have shared this space with you all. So um, again, my name is Hannah Honani. I'm the program manager for the Hopi Opportunity Youth Initiative or HOI for short. Um, <clears throat> our mission really, uh, I, I, well, let me just start by saying that HOI is a project of the Hopi Foundation. We are, um, the Hopi Foundation is a nonprofit, a longstanding nonprofit going on 34 years of operation. Um, and we are located here on Hopi. And so being a project in the Hopi Foundation um, to do this work, our mission is to improve the career, cultural and educational attainment of all Hopi youth. Um, and part of our goals around doing this initiative work is to do, um, is to build collaborations and partnerships with our community both on and off reservation, so long as they align with our mission and common goals of um, improving the circumstances of our youth. Um, we do this work by using data to guide our decision-making. Um, we, we help to build effective programming and pathways and developing supportive policies that, um, that support you know, the ever-changing um, ways in which youth are developing. And so um, to be amongst you all today and to understand, you know, where everyone um, has a role in this work, I'm really uh, thankful for the opportunity to share what the Hopi Opportunity Youth Initiative has done um, um, and how we've, you know, build our collaborative relationship with NAU and more specifically Daryl's team. Uh, we've been in existence since 2013. Um, and part of our coming to be was uh, uh, reaching out, being having 
been reached out by the Aspen Institute. And the Aspen Institute is cultivating at that time um, uh, opportunity youth work. And for them, opportunity youth meant at-risk youth. It was just a fancy way of saying at-risk youth. Um, <clears throat> and so part of, um, they invited us to apply for funding to begin this work in our community. Um, but we had to make a case that, you know, we didn't want to pay particular attention to this at-risk youth that they were talking about. And as, as Daryl was talking, I was thinking about how <clears throat> we address everyone in our community and it's not just um, a one particular community being left out. And so when we made the case to be a part of this larger network, we, um, we, we stated that all our, our youth are opportunity youth, which in my eyes in a positive, you know, flipping the, um, the script, so to speak, in that narrative is, all our, all our youth have the opportunity to be successful and not necessarily looking at the disparities that we have and focusing on that. Of course, that's important, but how do we use <clears throat> that word to empower our kids to, to be successful, whatever that means to them? And so a lot of this work was understanding how youth think, youth act, and youth communicate. And um, <clears throat> so as a launch, starting point to this work, um, we didn't want it to be um, adult driven. We wanted it to be youth led. And so part of um, the initial years of beginning Hoi, we host, hosted a lot of focus groups and um, youth gatherings where we ask kids, you know, what are those factors that determine you to be successful, however it is you define it. And part of <clears throat> And through these several conversations, we narrowed down three pathways that encompass um, a lot of what we're talking about today. And, and th those were our marching orders as Hoi staff, as our Hoi support system <clears throat> that allowed us to continue to do this work today. And those three pathways are mentoring, service learning, and cultural well being. Cultural well being, you know, talking about <clears throat> everything and anything that makes us Hopi or identify as Hopi and Tewa people. You know, that's our language, that's our ceremonies, that's our relationships, our complex, you know, kinships systems that we do have. Um, mentoring is, you know, they really wanted to have um, somebody, so a guidance, you know, somebody guiding them through life, whether that was a peer, somebody older, um, they really asked for um, that because it, uh, that lended another support system to their development if they were not getting that at home. And so when you think about <clears throat> in a cultural context or a cultural construct, it's, it's um, mentoring should come from, you know, your tahas for the boys and then your keas or your aunts on your paternal side for the girls. And so these are people you look up to to help guide you through life and to learn learn your role as whether it's a male or female. Um, and so those are ways in which we can incorporate mentoring. The other side, when you think about it, is through education. You know, somebody that's been through, you know, these different levels of education that can help you as well um, to, to um, get through those same systems. And then that brings back, you know, the reciprocate and being respective of one another. <clears throat> um, the other part was the service learning. Youth really voiced that they wanted to be of service to their community. They wanted to give back to their community and, and have, I guess this was their way of finding their place in the community, whether that was culturally um, or in a modern, in a more modern context. And so, you know, you really think about um, the different opportunities they have to do that, to do that. You know, it could be in through school, you know, they could be leading a extracurricular activity or in a cultural lens, you know, they could be um, given a certain responsibility in the Kiva for the boys or showing somebody uh, how to do something, whether it's, you know, male or female. Um, and so those are the three pathways that we've um, launched Hoi's work. And really those were our marching orders to 
identify how we make these partnerships in the community. And I do have a few partners um, on the call with us today, and I'm thankful for their showing up today and being a part of the conversation. Um, <clears throat> and then it wasn't until later, um, I wanna say about the third or fourth year in that we started using data. You know, that was always a, a goal of ours, but it didn't really become apparent until then that we started collecting information. We started asking, you know, doing surveys and whatnot, and that, you know, understanding and making the case for how much resources we need to fill the gap for our youth to, to even <clears throat> be successful or to reach a goal or a dream that they have. And so um, that's where we um, implemented a kind of fourth data, a uh, fourth pathway that interweaves into the, the three others, the cultural being the mentoring and the service learning. So we use all of this data to help inform our work and not just ours, but th those that we collaborate with, specifically with Dr. Daryl Joseph, you know, when he came and approached us about this project, you know, we are resilient. <clears throat> we had a lot of, we had a lot of work done already. You know, we laid a, a really basic foundation of, of what the current state is of our youth. And then, you know, we're gearing up, getting going to, to start our focus groups and to interact with youth and then, you know, the pandemic came. And so we we talked and brainstormed and, you know, where it's like, this is a really unique opportunity to understand how our kids are navigating this pandemic through, you know, what's already being laid out. But now you have um, this pandemic that has an interesting perspective and in how they look at, you know, themselves, they look at their community, how they're responding to the pandemic. And then, um, you know, how do we still continue moving forward? We're already a year in to the pandemic, you know, and it's crazy to look back now and say, I, I you know, never been home as much, you know, you're staying home, you're online, never been online this much before. Um, and not having that um, human interaction, you know, physically. And so it's, it's, uh, it's unique. And we just, we were, we were really asking ourselves, how do we, continue to do this work, but adding that um, that that perspective of navigating a pandemic on top of that, you know, and I can say that our kids are very resilient. They're very creative. They're very innovative in how they maintain, um, you know, what they still want to do. You know, they still have their goals in mind. They still have a drive, but, you know, what does that come from? And I think when um, um, Daryl was talking about <clears throat> the history of uh, his brother and how he, his experience of going through the different systems that he was put through to, to have an education, then you think about how things have progressed over time. These kids are, are, are um, paving the way for that for us as well. They're showing us, you know, what it is um, to do, what it is to, to navigate those systems, whether it's alone or having that um, support system all together. And so, um, <clears throat> so embarking on this We Are Resilient project, it's really, again, adding all those different layers of, of, of a youth um, identity as a, as a native person. And so through that, through those lens of resilience, you know, what are, we asked ourselves, what is the purpose of, creating a community partnership with representatives from the tribe and then implement our community-based research that we've already started and, and information that was to come out of this project. Um, and identify risk and protective factors informing, you know, the cultural well-being and mental health for Native American youth. And so when we talk about Native American youth, we were trying to target um, our own kids here um, but we also want it to be inclusive again, and really anybody and anybody that, you know, is uh, Native American youth living on the Hopi Reservation, you know, those are who the people we wanted to talk to. And then we added another layer of um, individuals who experience living with high incidence of disabilities. And so um, we, we had a lot of groundwork already done with Hawaii. And so when it when the opportunity arise for Daryl to um, present us with this opportunity to collaborate, you know, we, we had a good head start. Um, 
and so I'm really thankful to have, you know, continue this journey with him, you know, and the team for, you know, what we're about to do and the things that we're about to, to um, come across and, you know, write about, you know, write about our results and our outcomes of this project. And so I'm thankful for those that are here and want to give um, an opportunity for my team uh, from the Hawaii staff to add any thing that I may have left out. Okay. okay. Oh, really quick, Daryl. I just want to thank um, whoever looks like Sonoran UCEDD for putting up the information about us. I was going to do that earlier so that you can find this and find more information and how to get in contact with us. We do have a Facebook page um, and an Instagram page. Um, and so those links are both on our, our um, website there. So there's about six projects of the on the Hopi Foundation website, and those are include our, our local radio station, KUYI, um, our Hopi Substance Abuse Prevention Center, uh, Not Winnie Coalition, which is our agricultural project, um, and the Hopi Leadership Program. So um, you can find all of those projects on that website. But thank you, everybody. Quickly, thank you, Hannah. <clears throat> really appreciate that. Um, so just, uh, you know, there's so much more we can share about the project. Um, I really commend and appreciate and respect um, Hannah and her team. Um, you know, they stuck with us throughout this whole time. We've made changes because of the pandemic. Um, and so we're, we're just now getting, um, you know, uh, started with recruiting our, our youth um, at, with uh, those with and without disabilities. And we're very successful and we're learning a lot from their stories, um, which is very important. And, and so we're still early in that process. And um, hopefully by the end of the summer, we should have more people um, involved in that project. Uh, so if you would like to learn more, I'll also post, uh, you know, through Hannah's website, you can contact us or um, I will post another link to um, an extension of, the, of our project that we're doing together. Um, I want to finish us out with uh, a final few comments, um, you know, for everyone and, and finish with a, a story, a, a digital story um, that is also part of the story that Dr. Ally Joseph shared last week um, with Ivy Sania. Um, the in Indigenous resilience is really the inclusion again of Indigenous knowledge and experiences to overcome difficult and ongoing challenges. And as Hannah explained, um, her project is, is exemplifying that, um, making essential those experiences and knowledge systems and how um, we engage in the work that we're doing. Um, also, I think what was very profound um, that was state, stated last week um, was this idea that youth well being determines the health of the next generation and can predict, help predict future public health challenges for families, communities, and healthcare systems. And that I hope that's very true. Uh, the intent of our work with as Hannah is uh, one thing we didn't mention is that we're inviting community partners as well from um, the schools, from the behavioral health programs, social services programs, um, programs within um, the tribe that serve our youth communities. Um, with the intent that we will want to take the next step of identifying um, interventions or supports that can su further support our youth um, and identifying funding mechanisms that can support that. Um, and so with that said, I, I want to leave you with one last story of resilience. I want to thank you for giving all of us time today uh, to be part of this inaugural Youth Summit, we look forward to engaging with all of you into the future. Um, we On our PowerPoint, I believe it'll be accessible to you um, through the Sonoran you said, uh, but we've provided some references for you uh, for further reading. In addition, um, the links to each of the digital stories that we have available around resilience. Uh, and we do want to give thanks again to our partners um, and friends at the Great Lakes Equity Center. Um, their website is here and they've really um, uh, curated a lot of these resources specifically for our project. Uh, so we want to thank them. And in the last page is our contact information. 
Uh, so let me go to the video really quickly and um, get that started for you. Okay, could you also hit the closed uh, captioning uh, button on the video? <laughs> Thank you. That. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. Okay, here we go. No worries. This is my story of how I accepted my disability. I was able to adapt to the new physical, emotional, and spiritual changes. For 25 years of my life, I was able to grasp life with both hands. Then suddenly, I was forced to hold on with one. I encountered simple everyday tasks with frustration, anger, and sadness. I took my life for granted. Tying my own shoes became a challenge. Driving a standard vehicle was not an option. My spirit was broken. I felt lost, ashamed, and incapable of living a normal life due to my physical limitations, but I refused to be limited. I challenged myself to find new ways to master simple daily tasks. The loss of my arm prevented me from feeling accepted, looked up to, and upholding my cultural responsibilities. I traveled an emotional roller coaster of pain, shame, and guilt through the stages of grief. Through the beat of the drum, a new sound reverberated and healed my broken spirit, healed my mind, mended my heart, and renewed my soul. Through singing powwow, I felt a new sense of belonging. I was found through spirituality, through the songs. Through my depression, I coped with accepting my self-image by abusing alcohol and illegal substances. I found comfort and the ease of pain through self-medication. I realized that a life cannot move forward without change. I began my journey eight years ago. Sobriety became a new way of life. I began to reshape my new independent self by finding work, having attained an associate's degree of applied science in network engineering, and recently being able to participate in my Hopi cultural ceremonies. Today, I continue to live a life of harmony and balance through the sharing of my story. Ove uma navasyane. Stop share. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you, Hoi team. Thank you, Teresa, uh, for being part of our presentation today. Um, Kimberly, we are completed with our presentation. Thank you for having us. Beautiful. I wish we were out in a big open room. I see the big old Lakota Lili. <laughs> Phenomenal information. Thank you. Dr. Joseph, Dave, thank you, Dr. Ali Joseph, too, for the presentation last week was um, very great information we can all benefit from. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. Thank you, Ms. Honani and Ms. Martza and all of the team for lending us your special time. Um, resilience is what we need right now during this time. So the Hopi youth, really great work you're doing out there for them and for the community. So thank you, sir.